And we are back. We are back with Kit O'Connell of KitOConnell.com. I highly recommend everyone go to Kit's site. It's fantastic. He has all of his work up that he's that he's done, um, you know, for for a while now since he's. Uh, I mean, even before he went on his own as a uh, independent Gonzo journalist, um, you know, there's just a lot of great work. What's going on on the activist scene, the leftist activist scene in particular? Um, you know, podcasts that Kit's been on. Um, you know, he, he's uh, he's he's doing a lot of great work for for left leftist activists, and and I really enjoy. Uh, going on his site and, and checking out everything he has, and I and I suggest people go to his site and support him. You know, drop a little, drop a little money in his Patreon. The man needs to eat, and so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so go and support Kit. He's a good guy, and uh, he's he's uh, he's out there fighting the good fight. Welcome back to the show, Kit. It's always a pleasure, and thanks for the introduction. I always I always appreciate that too. So we're going to lead off with <clears throat> Nazis target yeah. target Kit's class at Houston Anarchist Book Fair 2017. So when I imagine what's going on here is like this is just like my like stereotype mind, uh, you know, going into. I've never been to a uh, an anarchist gathering or anything like that. But what I imagine going on here in something like this is. You guys are all sitting around, listening to Woody Guthrie, and passing the, <laughs> passing the peace pipe, and you know a bunch of crazy Nazis in face masks run up on you guys, and 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 you know everything it gets really weird from there. But I don't know. You you can correct me. I mean, uh, you know, uh, as far as book fairs go, it's you know an anarchist book fair is pretty much like any other book related event I've been to. Uh, you know, there was a, it was held at a community center in Houston, uh, in a, you know, mostly Latino neighborhood, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, this has a long history of involvement with community activism in this place, and uh, the organizers uh, did, a, did a great job of, of uh, putting this on and, and uh, uh, keeping everyone safe when it, when it hit the fan. Uh, you know, and they kept the event going, too, which also I want to point out, you know, it's really admirable, too, is, like, they've been playing this event, this book fair, for months, and then uh, Harvey, you know, hit, and as we talked about a little bit last month, uh, a lot of these people, you know, all the activists I know in Texas, we've all been trying to help out, you know, with relief efforts, and, and so there was, like, should we keep doing the book fair? There was a lot of question about that, but they ended up deciding to keep having the book fair. About 300 people came out over the course of the day, and actually, you know, because of Harvey, it brought people in from all over the country who had come in to help out, came to the book fair to talk about their experiences and what it means to offer help directly to each other, which, of course, is really one of the core, you know, tenets of, of anarchist philosophy is this idea that we're better off directly engaging with each other rather than through this medium of a government. Um, so, you know, the book fair itself was, you know, there's a big cent central room where they had lots of zines and books from various small publishers, and, you know, throughout the day we had classes. And, uh, yeah, one of the classes I, uh, my class uh, from my, my collective, uh, the OSWN collective, oh, shoot, what now? We'll call it on the radio. Uh, and uh, we do a class that we've done a couple times called Punching Nazis, and it's about the philosophy and history and tactics of anti-fascism. And you know, this is certainly a provocative title, but we talk about, you know, all the different ways. I, you know, I'm, I'm the instructor, so I talk about all the different ways that people oppose fascism and, you know, the, the white supremacy and the dangerous nationalist far right. And, you know, obviously we talk about the street confrontations that have gotten so much uh, attention lately, including Richard Spencer getting punched at the inaugural protest, which is where the class gets its name. Um, but we also talk about all the different ways that people oppose fascism around the world. One of my favorite examples that I love, we show a video of it, and you can look online, and I'll link to it on Twitter after the show, but it's this group called the Lulgers of Odin. And there's a white supremacist group in Scandinavia called the Soldiers of Odin. Uh, and so these groups, the Lulgers of Odin, L-O-L-Gers, they dress up like clowns. 
and they make fun of these this white supremacist group by being like, look, we're clowns and so are you. And it becomes impossible for these white supremacists to have a serious gathering because there's clowns dancing around them and throwing snowballs or whatever. Um, and that's one of my favorite examples of creative anti-fascism that we talk about in this class. So anyway, we got about halfway through the class. We're just talking about the history of anti-fascism and how it was created, uh, you know, the, the roots of it lead back to the aftermath of World War II. Um, <clears throat> and people helping to sort of eradicate the remnants of Nazis in Germany and around Europe. And just as we're doing that, you know, the security for the event runs in because we know we need everybody out of the classroom right now just so we can all, you know, be in a safe place. And they were blocking the doors, and I found out later that the Nazis had made multiple attempts to get in. And we look out, you know, you could look out the windows or the windows in the, in the front door, and there, you know, it was like about two dozen Nazis. They had their Nazi banner that said blood and soil on it. They were lighting flares. They were chanting blood and soil and other uh, just homophobic, vile garbage. And they were personally calling me out, which was really unpleasant. I guess they wanted me to come out and personally fight them. Uh, of course, not only were we outnumbered, but they, you know, I don't know what weapons they were carrying, but the visible weapons they had, they all had those um, tactical gloves, which are basically like plastic brass knuckles built into a pair of gloves. And they were all wearing those. And, you know, they were like, come out and fight us, Kit. And it's like, you know, I'm a disabled uh, activist uh, pushing 40, and there was like 30 dudes out there expecting me to come out and fight. And needless to say, our first priority was to protect everybody inside. But really, security's first priority was the people who worked and organized the book fair, all volunteers. You know, they did an incredible job of keeping everybody safe, keeping the Nazis from entering. Once it was clear that we weren't going to be drawn into some ridiculous fight with them uh, that wasn't going to benefit anybody and just get the book fair shut down, you know, they basically had their little photo op out front where they lit their flares and took photos. And they stole a banner that had been made for the day called the Houston, it just said, you know, Houston Anarchist Book Fair. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they took off and then they spent the next three days, you know, taunting me on social media and sending pictures of the stuff they'd stolen from the front of the building. Uh, and just generally acting like giant babies, which is sort of, I sort of consider them really dangerous babies. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, obviously they've never learned to share the world with other people. Um, you know, they're somehow, it seems like they're stuck in a very immature phase. Of course, they're, they're incredibly dangerous and even deadly, as we've seen this year, unfortunately. Maybe that's the next move for those anti-fascist clowns. They should dress up like just adult babies with diapers on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I think that kind of thing that, that highlights uh, just their, their ridiculousness it can be really powerful. All right, so next up here is, well, I'm glad no one got hurt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next up here is a message from Texas. When the left fights together, we win. So uh, what, what, is, what is this about? You, you guys are, uh, are doing some activist work at the state legislature, from what I understand. Yeah, um, and uh, some of this is kind of a, a sort of a post-mortem on some stuff that happened over the summer. Uh, this, this particular piece, the message from Texas on the left fights together, we win, is a, a piece for the, the TV show Act Out, which is a, you know independent TV show by Eleanor Goldfield that I write for from time to time. It's a great show. People should definitely check out her work, all of her work even the part that I don't contribute to. Uh, but uh, what happens, in, it's, so, so I think we talked a little before about Texas politics, but it's very strange here. Most of our business as a government, as a state government, it has to happen in about uh, five months, about you know, just a few months, every other year. That legislature only opens every other year for less than six months. And all the business of the state is supposed to be crammed into that time. Um, but... You know, there's this sort of like escape clause, this thing called a special session. And it's supposed to be for emergencies where, you know, for example, uh, there was some sort of disaster or something or, or uh, you know, they just they need money and they need to, to pass a law immediately to get that money moving or whatever. That's what the special session is supposed to be for. The governor under the state constitution can call an unlimited number of these special sessions. And they're very expensive because if you think about it, the state house is closed, like I said, and they have to staff it all back up. It's not just paying the lawmakers who get a daily you know, wage just for being politicians, but that's all their anal policy analysts, secretaries, janitors, people working the cafeteria. All that stuff has to come back online. It's incredibly expensive to taxpayers. So here's what happened. Uh, 
is our, 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 our legislature opened in January, our normal session, and lo and behold, at the end of the special session, they hadn't been able to pass a bathroom bill, which I mean bathroom bill, of course, I mean these horrible ideas to restrict who can go to the bathroom where to try to legislate essentially the genitals of transgender people. It's ridiculous and it's offensive and it limits the access. It's not just about bathrooms. It limits people's access to public life. You know, they can't participate in politics or just the everyday stuff that you and I take for granted because they're worried that some potty police are going to be upset about where they go to the bathroom. It's the most ridiculous thing. And, of course, it's based purely on a made-up fear. There's, no, there's never been a single incident of a transgender person uh, hurting anybody or attacking anybody in a bathroom. It's purely a way for these, you know, fundamentalists to push back against the progress that queer and transgender people have made. And so they ended the special session and they hadn't passed this awful quote-unquote bathroom bill. And so they orchestrated an emergency, which was they, they didn't pass this special uh, funding bill that, that funds um, uh, the medical agencies, basically. Basically, it keeps, you know, whoever, the, the agency that licenses doctors and nurses in Texas was going to run out of money. And they purposely made that happen so that they could have an excuse for a special session. And once they declared the special session, they had this 20-point agenda that included this ridiculous smorgasbord of attacks on just everything that we could possibly care about. So they wanted to push the bathroom bill again. They wanted new restrictions on abortion and Planned Parenthood. They were going to attack public workers' unions. Um, one of the more ridiculous pieces, they attacked um, the ability of cities to protect old trees. Right? Like you have a historic tree in your town square, and so you pass a local registration saying, you know, trees over a certain size are over 300 years old. You need to have a discussion before you chop that down. Well, they banned that. Well, they wanted to ban that. And so what had to happen was, you know, this, this broad coalition of activists group came together from across the left to really push back against it. And it was really interesting because it brought, you know, it brought... Uh, LGBTQ rights groups together with labor rights groups and voting rights groups and the ACLU and movements like Indivisible. And what was really extraordinary was that by working together, by having this really diverse coalition across issues that we wouldn't necessarily normally link together, although I do think they are connected at the bottom, of course, but by bringing all these groups together, of course, we've built people power. And for once, the left was able to keep it back together uh, and not, you know, just constantly be fighting. And it really worked. You know, a couple, unfortunately, some harmful bills did slip through, including a new restriction on uh, how people can pay for their abortions using insurance. But otherwise, almost everything that the governor wanted to, to push through got beaten. And one of the most interesting things that happened was the Speaker of the House, a uh, Republican named Joe Strauss, he came out near the end of this month-long special session, and he said, we're not even going to hear the bathroom bill. And the reason we're not going to hear the bathroom bill is that it endangers transgender people, and I don't want the suicide of a transgender kid on my hands. Now, that's not the kind of compassionate speech that we hear out of the mouths of Republicans anymore. Um, you know, these are people who want to slash rights and slash health care, and are just like, well, if it kills people, who cares? And here we had a Republican saying, look, if we, if we, if we pass this law, which is unnecessary, we're going to hurt people that are vulnerable already. And so that was just a sign that activists really made a difference in reaching someone. It wasn't just about business that was going to be lost. Of course, just like in North Carolina, there are corporations putting pressure on the state not to pass this law, but it was really about the human impact. You know, from everything you just said, you know, it was a very powerful situation. Um, but, I mean, above all of the things regarding, you know, the human impact of what you were talking about, I was also struck by the fact that the, you, you said the Texas legislature is only open for a window of a period of time once every two years. Yeah, yeah. How's that even possible? I mean, are, are the, how do you get anything done in a situation like that? And B, are these people paid like, you know, full-time employees? I, you know, I don't think that they're paid. They make a daily wage when the, the legislature is in session. Um, I'm not sure if they get some kind of stipend otherwise. I know obviously like the state helps them run off. You know, they, they run offices and stuff. And so they obviously have some funds year-round. Um, but, yeah, it's just ridiculous that like, Texas is not 
it's not a well-governed state, and this system is really a piece, a huge piece of that. I have to say, um, you know, it's it's kind of like there's very little oversight. The kind of the state agencies obviously continue to function to one degree or another, you know, throughout the year. It's like this: the Department of Education for the state rolls up and goes home the rest of the year. But the law, the legislature itself, is closed. That giant granite building at the center of Austin is essentially empty uh, for most of every two years. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's a really bizarre, it's an inefficient, it's a ridiculous system. And, you know, people from other states can't quite believe that that's how, you know, one of the most powerful states in the nation runs their government. But that's how it is. And there's also a history of using these special sessions for kind of these sorts of ridiculous non-emergencies. The most, one of the, probably the most notable, of course, is 2013. People remember Wendy Davis, you know, protesting that abortion law with that filibuster that then was supported by the thousands of activists that had crammed into the, into the Capitol to oppose this anti-abortion bill. And in, in 2013, they actually used two special sessions to force that abortion bill through that the Supreme Court ended up mostly overturning. It didn't get passed in the regular session, so they called for a special session, and then Wendy Davis and activists kind of, and, and a lot of people working together shut that down, and so they called another special session to force it through. Um, and fortunately, in this case, they just sort of felt defeated and felt like there was too much infighting even within the legislature uh, to call a second special session to try to do anything here. Yeah, you guys aren't governed very well. You, you, guys, are pretty no. much, you guys are pretty much on your own in Texas. You know, you've got to fend for yourself, it seems. And it shows, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty crazy. I, I've... It baffles me, you know, states like that, and, you know, I can see some of the benefit of, of, of a structure like that. Like, if you want to live out in the country, you want to live on your own, you know, away from, you know, regulation and all of that sort of thing, you know, I, I get the appeal. You know, I from what I understand, there are areas of Texas where, you know, you don't even need to get okay for the, you know, electrical wiring in your house. If it burns down, that's on you. You know, it's it's you don't you don't need uh, any any sort of uh, approval from the government out here. You need approval for every single thing. If you want to, if you want to add like two feet to your deck, you need you need a zone a new zoning uh, uh, request to the town board or whatever. But uh, yeah, I, I I completely get the uh, the appeal for for a lack of government, but. To take it to the level where the government is only meeting once every two years, I mean, that, <laughs> I, I, you, you can't meet the needs of the, you can't possibly meet the needs of the people at that point. Well, and yeah, and it's like even if you know, I'm, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I, I do lean anarchist. I usually just describe myself as a radical because I, I don't, I don't think those titles are always meaningful at this stage in our history, but. You know, I'm certainly, I, I see the appeal, too. I hear exactly what you're saying. But it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't end up meeting the needs of people. And it also, like, you know, we talk, like, in Houston, and we go back to Hurricane Harvey again. You know, Houston is famously unzoned, and you can build whatever you want, anywhere you want there. And sure, there's an appeal to that, especially if you're the third person that can build, if you have the money to build. But it also results in, you know, poor people who are underwater because their best option was a shoddily built house on a floodplain. And that doesn't serve the need of the people. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. If we want to talk about, you know, post-government, you know, societies, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation. But it sure doesn't look like, you know, this is just sort of uh, apathy and neglect. And that's really what we're talking about. Yeah, that, that is it right there. Uh, Kit O'Connell of KitOConnell.com. Everyone go to KitOConnell.com. Support. Go to his Patreon. Drop a little in his bucket there. You know, Kit... Kit's got to make a living, and, you know, he's, he's putting out all of this great information, all of these great ideas um, out there for us. Kit, thank you again for coming on the show today. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, keep an eye on my website. I've got two big stories coming out soon. I'll, I'll see you next month. All right, Kit. Have a good one. All right, and we will be back with Turd Ferguson of TF Metals Report. Com. Stay tuned for that for our Economics and Precious Metals Report. We will be right back. <laughs> 